This episode of the Answer is Yes Baja Sessions is brought to you by Baja Bound Insurance Services. Driving to Mexico? You can buy and print out your Mexican auto insurance policy online in minutes with their easy-to-use website. They also have great travel information to help you plan your trip south of the border. Visit BajaBound.com. Welcome to the Baja Sessions. This is Ryan Thomas, and I am super stoked today to get to reintroduce a guest uh, that we had on last week, Bruce Myers. Um, the father of, of the modern day dune buggy, I, I think we can call him. Um, he was so full of information, so so full of story that uh, we couldn't condense it all into a half an hour episode. So um, we're lucky to get to break it up into two. And uh, I, I can say I thoroughly enjoyed my time at, at Bruce and Winnie's house last week. Um, they were very hospitable and, and just really opened up their souls to their story. And um, we're so lucky to get to share that with you here in, in this second episode. Um, if you haven't listened to the first one, really encourage you to do it because you'll get some of the backstory of um, Bruce's life. And uh, he talks about um, the, the path of, of an artist and how um, in his life that path uh, crossed over the, the path of an engineer and, and his last words uh, in, in uh, this first part of, of the, the episode were, uh, that he's a, a an artist and an engineer mixed up. And we dive into the second half of this uh, episode, and he tells us a lot about um, the life of adventure that he had in Baja, but then we also get to hear um, more about how much love means to Mr. Bruce Myers, and then ultimately we get into some pretty deep topics, um, um, the big one of forgiveness and how learning to forgive really changed his life. So, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as much as much as Jim and I did. Um, sit down and relax and turn it up. Bruce, if, if uh, with art being the topic here, can you, you you shared a little bit of your early story about being an artist? Can you can you retell some of that now that we've got the recorder on about <laughs> being in school and how you did the mural? Because I think you know you just showed me something about how important <coughs> the artistry of the vehicle design is. And I love your background. Can, can you retell that story, please? Well, you know, there's figure drawing, and then there's portraiture. And there was a time in this world when there wasn't any cameras. Um, I have a little book out there, The Christmas Carol by that crazy Englishman. And every drawing in it is a drawing done by hand because it was printed in 1842. Um, before we had cameras, you had to have artists. When you think of reading anything in a newspaper or a magazine, it's always photography. But there was a time when there wasn't any cameras. And, and it all had to be done by people that knew how to draw. Now that little book is the most delicately beautiful drawings. Oh my gosh. I'm I'm jealous of the guy. He's so beautiful. But he was the illustrator. Uh, people just roar past all that. I have uh, drawings on my wall. I'll show you guys. A lot of my stuff was done when I was 20 years old. And I was really good. But people glance and just walk away. They don't stop and examine them. They're handmade drawings. They're a piece of three dimension on a flat surface that's not easy so drawings were an elegant way to use as illustrations when there was a time with no cameras and we've forgotten all that because the camera is gone or the camera takes over the whole thing so it's just part of our fast world I don't blame anybody I, I'm not jealous because they don't look at my nice drawings. <laughs> um, it, it, we had a party out in our warehouse, and the, these drawings were sitting on an easel. I think two people stopped for maybe more than a moment. <laughs> it, it's okay. It, it's what you must understand as being um, kind of a secret of your own, and I'm not uh, in love with the idea of having learned to draw so well, and I wanted to be a... I wanted to be one of the guys that put the presidents on her money. You know, in those four, five, or six, they're gorgeous things, and they're tiny. They're, they're the size of a 50-cent piece, and they're beautiful. They're gorgeous pieces of figure drawing. 
and all that is something of the past, which I'm still in love with. I'm sorry that I'm still hung up over it, uh, but it's a part of why you have a Mars Manx. If it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be a Mars Manx. You realize that the Manx is not just a piece of mechanical stuff. It's something else. It's it's beyond that, and I, I knew that, and I wanted to uh, embellish the Manx with an insistence that you can't not look at it. <laughs> I, I, you know, wherever you drive, uh, drive a Manx, if you're especially with three or four or five of them, and you're driving somewhere, like we went up to Monterey last year, all the way, horns being honked, thumbs being raised, you know, the high signs, to- tooting, tooting, tooting. It's like you're in a parade of your own. <laughs> you just driving around and one kind of pisses you off. You, you finally get tired of it <laughs> because people keep wanting to, I don't know, wave at you or something because they think you're in a parade. The car looks like a cartoon, I guess. That's It, it brings its its attention that way. So, so it's an artistically inspired, mostly um, uh, well-engineered vehicle that allowed dreamers to venture into places that they may otherwise never gone, never have gone. You took it to Baja and changed or started <laughs> a culture. Isn't that amazing? And I, I question for you. I mean, th- that was over 50 years ago. Does going to Baja still bring you the kind of, of um, well, the joy, the sense of adventure? Oh, my it's, God. It's, you lots would... of things have changed. Is, is Baja still the same for you? I get tired of Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> That's not to say that I have a daughter that was born in Mexico. She's a, the only blonde, blue-eyed Mexican that I know. Yeah. <laughs> she was born in Tijuana. I did that purposely. But, um, you know, we have a club, the Manx Club, and it's it's around the world, but most of it's in the United States. And the Eastern people love to come out here and be taken to Baja. And we have groups, eight or ten people, and we put them in buggies and cars, and we go down and watch the race. And they all come home screwed up. They're, they've been, oh, I don't know. They're, they've fallen in love with something. And uh, our club is a big love affair, but the people in it, especially the girls, I love all the girls, of course, but uh, they, they're so um, they're so taken with the... Uh, the craziness of it, you're, you're chased along with the Nora one. It's every night you stop and there's fun and tomorrow we race again and five days of this and you're at the other end and here they are doing things in, only in Mexico, shooting off monster fireworks right in front of you, 20 feet away and they're coming back down on top of you and they just see all that as a, a huge experience and they, I've heard them say, oh, it's better than going to Europe. Yeah. <laughs> see, the whole thing becomes such a circus and there's so many people, and there's so much attention, and uh, it's all in a place where uh, it's foreign. That boy that was in here was Jagger. My, he speaks perfect Spanish, and he loves to go with them because at the dinner table there's 12 people, and they don't know what the hell they're reading, and he sits there and explains all. He loves to cook. So it, they, they have this experience that is uh, unique, um, fresh, uh, unforgettable, and they go home, and next year, here they are. They want to come and go back down there again. See, so it's 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 a huge pleasure to to treat them to that. My being there is kind of embarrassing. I mean, I I like the attention. On the other hand, not too much. <laughs> I don't know what you're. What am I trying to say? <laughs> you want to enjoy yourself without shaking a whole bunch of hands all day. <laughs> something like that. Or something like I'll that. I'll say it for you. <laughs> something like that. Anyway, it's it's a lot of pleasure, a lot of fun. That 50 years of this sort of thing, and and people are enjoying it. And of course, it's a different thing now. It all started with a handful of little dune buggies. And um, today, I started to tell you about the guy that came out there. He's never done this. He has lots of money. He's got a number 10 car, and they all went out to test it. The shock absorbers or something out in the desert. And Jagger came back telling me the stories about all these this house trailer that's got two bathrooms and endless, you know, elegance. I, I don't like that story. <laughs> that's not the way it was. Yeah, I'm not 
I'm not drawn to that. See, he's the big, the big expensive motorhomes and the big colorful stuff is no doubt. It's like Jimmy Fluger came over from Hawaii, and his son is racing, and he's got a lot of money. And they're sitting out in the desert, and it's hotter than hell. So he says, "To hell with this." He gets a push-up tent, above-ground pool, two or three water trucks to fill the pool. They sit in the pool with their beer. That's their pit, pit stop. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> it just takes a lot of money. <laughs> a couple of three water trucks to keep your pool full. See, that's, it's, it's grown into something that's kind of a big look at me. It's like driving a Ferrari. A, a red Ferrari is a look at me car. So is a dune buggy. It's a hell of a lot <laughs> I cheaper. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Different budget. <laughs> Same no, objective. Yeah, but see, the ego is always in front. The, man ego, the male ego, the male dominant thing is always, I don't know, I see it too quickly. And I don't think they see it at all. Bruce, I, I think, uh, and, and I appreciate your, your position on the guy that shows up with the trailer that has two bathrooms, because that's also, also the guy that shows up to a race the day of, gets in the race car, races, and then he flies back home. Yeah. And, and I think the most important memories and the most important part of the race is before and after with your team, sitting around the campfire, telling the stories of how the day went, what broke and what you fixed, and the camaraderie that comes along with that. And um, th- those are the memories I cherish the most, and, I, and I'm sure that that's probably what you're referring to well, is time with people. I, I, you know, I've watched this evolution from peanuts to what we got. Yeah. And it's uh, – I, all I see is the, the red Ferrari kind of thing. Look at me. Come on. How about – there's more to it than that. It's movie star time. You know, it's it's – it's something that's gone beyond something that I like. I'm I'm much too honest to be, I hope I'm honest, to, to be able to see this. And they see it as a kind of an opportunity to, sh- to show off or something, a bragging thing. Is that true? Am, well, am I, I wrong? Well, I'm, I'm going to counter you here. Okay. Because when you did it 50 years ago, what what ended up happening? It got published around the world by road and track and you're pretty proud of that yes that's that's a very big reason yes i mean but and and you're you're admitting that hey you know that this the human ego the male ego is is a a a massive driving force for all of us i i i don't okay i'm not i'm not finding fault with what you're saying what i'm saying is is that that um at some core level it's always ego but what i what i like about your era versus the 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 two bathrooms and air conditioning era is that you were a real man. Yeah. You put up with some pretty <laughs> harsh, uh, conditions. harsh conditions, really pioneering. I mean, it, one, one could argue, I mean, there, were, there, there were obviously people that, that went by horseback down that peninsula, you know, Mama, longer ago. Mama Espinosa. Yeah. She knew me. We were friends. Mama Espinosa was at, what's the little village? El, El Rosario. El Rosario. Yep. When we first went there, we're in dune buggies. There's three of us. We pull up, and we're, we've got a book, Gerhard and Gulick. We're trying to follow where in the hell, where is this, what is this place? And we stand outside the door, and Mama Espinosa standing inside, and she's watching us, and we're all trying to say, how in the hell do you say eggs? It's huevos, isn't it? <laughs> well, we walk in the door, she says, what do you want, pancakes? <laughs> whoa, whoa, where did you come from? Well, she was raised in America. At the age of six, she was in a horse-drawn wagon, carried from rancho to rancho, from that place, over 200 miles to uh, somewhere up uh, by the Salton Sea. And she went to grade school every year for eight, nine months, and then back and forth, this for 10 years, from six to 16. So she learned all about English. She's learned about the American way of life, I guess. But she wanted to live there, and she started that little place. And she was a very strong personality. Like other females along the, those places, uh, they brought in a refrigeration. They brought in paved roads. They brought in electricity. They were, you know, predominant um, mayors, leaders of those places. And she was 
by far the strongest. But she had a line, she had a saying, said, 